Good morning. Good morning. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5. Jeremiah, chapter 5. And let us go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time you give us together. It's a local congregation, part of your body, Lord. Gathered together around your word, Lord, seeking to learn more of your truth, seeking to become better disciples as we gather together corporately to worship you through study, through song, through fellowship, Lord. And Lord, we just ask that you take us now and take us through your word and let us gain that degree closer to you, Lord, that greater maturity that we're all seeking, Lord that we may all be better witnesses to the world outside, Lord. Better brothers and sisters one to another and better disciples of yours, Lord. That you may be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, well in our study of Jeremiah last week, we saw it start with a plea from God for Israel to return to him and he would protect them from the invading nations. He wanted them to wash the wickedness from their hearts. He wanted them to circumcise their hearts, to give up all of their idol worship and trust in other nations, and thus avoid his wrath, which was coming upon them in the form of war with Egypt <clears throat> and invasion by Babylon. But God knows this will not happen. And in verse 22 of chapter 4, he had Jeremiah sum up the problem. For my people were foolish, they have not known me. They are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. So then as a result, today in chapter 5, we will continue with this prophetic cry of Jeremiah. And now he will list some of the reasons for God's judgment and follow that up with some details on the judgment itself. Let's begin by reading verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Though they say, as the Lord lives, Surely they swear falsely. Here we have reason number one. There is no one in Jerusalem who executes judgment. The New American Standard says who does justice. This is speaking in regards to the treatment of Israelites by other Israelites. Since they had ceased keeping God's law, they had become corrupt. Merchants cheated customers. The judgment of elders in the gates could be bought for the right amount. So the rich stole from the poor. This is how relative treated relative in this modern idolatrous Jerusalem. Pardon me, sweetie. Would you bring up my water? Reason number two. Thank you. No one sought the truth. No one was interested in following the law of God or any of the related scriptural instructions they had in their possession. As we've learned previously, every level of society in Israel had become corrupted by idolatry. So absolutely no one was seeking God's truth. Now, is God being literal here, or is this hyperbole? Some hold both of those thoughts. After all, we must remember that Jeremiah is here, and possibly Zephaniah, King Josiah and Baruch if this teaching is during Jeremiah's early years. So there were literally some truth seekers in Jerusalem during this time. Well, if it is hyperbole, God has made his point well regarding the vast majority of the population. And if it is literal from a different period in Jeremiah's life, then think of the sad irony here. Back in Genesis chapter 18, we have Abraham bargaining with God to try to save Sodom, where his nephew Lot and his family lived. Abraham bargained God all the way down to ten righteous people in Sodom to save it. Abraham thought that surely there must be ten righteous people living in Sodom. 
in order to save it. But as we know, Abraham was wrong. But look at what we are dealing with here. We are now talking about Jerusalem, the home of King David, the home of the holy temple of Yahweh with his priests and his holy presence in the temple. Yet in this city in which God who created and sustained the universe was present, not ten, not even one person who acted justly or sought the truth could now be found. As verse 2 tells us, though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. They would swear based on the existence of the one true God, but their oaths were false because they no longer worshipped him as the one true God. But God did not stop trying to bring them back, as we saw last week. And Jeremiah questions whether the problem actually exists at all levels of Israelite society. Let's read verses 3 through 5. O oh Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Jeremiah starts by pointing out that although the Israelites do not seek truth, our Lord's eyes are always on the truth proclaiming it and seeking it in mankind. And in order to save his people, he has continued to strike them and has let many go to consumption in order to turn the rest back to him. But Israel has refused his correction, instead just making their faces and their hearts harder against him. You know, that's something we can all see if we witness regularly to unsafe friends and family which is why we need to always keep them in prayer as well. Because this is not a contest they will win. Just as Israel's hardness of heart against our Lord and God only gained them war, captivity, and in many cases, death. And although we know the major, the major use of salvation in the Old Testament refers to the, physically, the physical saving of someone, when we speak of death today for the unbeliever, we're talking about eternal death and damnation. So it is very important that we keep witnessing to them and that we keep praying for them. Here, though, in Jeremiah, he has seen how God's efforts have proven ineffective against the hardened hearts of the Israelites. So he postulates that perhaps those efforts have only been toward the poor, uneducated masses. Surely the educated, the leaders, the kings, princes, governors, priests and prophets know better. They must be in harmony with the Lord. But what does Jeremiah find? Verse 5 at the end. But these have all together broken the yoke and burst the bonds. The New American Standard says, but they too with one accord have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. They have all together, they too with one accord, all of the educated, the leaders of the nation, both in government and in spiritual leadership, all of them, with one accord, have turned totally away from God and have decided to make their own decisions and seek their own alliances without trusting in the God who saved them from a life of slavery and who gave them this land flowing with milk and honey. That is what broken the yoke and burst the bonds means here. You must remember those words from back in our study of Jeremiah chapter 2 where we have the controversial verse 20, where the debate is whether it says that God broke their yoke and burst their bonds, or whether it says that they, the Israelites, broke their own yoke and burst their bonds, saying, I will not serve. That is what the leaders of all type in Israel have done here, which is why all of Israel will now be judged. Let's read verse 6. Therefore a lion of the forest shall slay them, a wolf of the deserts shall destroy them, a leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Their backslidings have increased. Now this is an interesting metaphor. Interesting because 
the threat of wild animals, such as the lion, the wolf, and the leopard, really did exist in the undeveloped areas of Israel at this time. But here we know it is not the wild animals who brought God's punishment on Israel. It was other nations, pagan nations, who embody the characteristics of these animals, the strength of the lion, the voraciousness of the wolf, and the speed of the leopard. Some attribute these characteristics to a variety of nations which came against Israel. Others attribute them all to Babylon. I think both are right. However, here the focus is on Babylon because Judah's time is running out. God will now continue with his reasons for judgments. Let's read verses 7 through 9. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods. When I fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were like well-fed lusty stallions, each one, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? As we have seen before, Jeremiah here is showing the all-consuming lusts the Israelites had for pagan idol worship and its emphasis on illicit sexual activity to please the false gods. <coughs> God had given them a comfortable life. He had fed them to the full. And that is when they turned from him toward false gods. Perhaps that should speak to us loudly here today in the United States. We too have been fed to the full by our Lord for many, many decades, of centuries perhaps. And the more comfortable our country became, the more people turned away from God. The unsaved, who used to at least realize the value of the Ten Commandments and other Christian values as a reasonable way of life. And unfortunately, many of the saved, who are more interested in Sunday entertainment at their churches and living isolated Christian lives in their little enclaves, never venturing out to share the gospel with others. So then here's Israel, as comfortable as can be, sinning to the max against God and not caring about it. The Israelite men, moving in great numbers, like troops assembled for battle, only now they were going to the brothels to visit the prostitutes. And that was not enough. They also sought illicit relationships with their neighbors' wives. Spiritual adultery led to physical adultery, according to Dr. Constable. <coughs> Knowing all of this, God states his totally righteous position in verse 9. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? God has just adequately made his case so, of course, the answer to both of these questions is yes. God has spelled out both the blessings and cursings that would happen and what kind of behavior would trigger each occurrence in his covenant with Israel. So, indeed, he had the right to punish them and avenge himself on this nation. God will now give a general instruction on how to carry out this punishment and end this section with more evidence. Let's read verses 10 through 13. Go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets become wind, for the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. Back to verse 10. I don't know why the King James Version and my new King James Version start verse 10 by saying, go up on her walls. The Hebrew word here, translated as walls, translated in my version as walls, is so raw. And it literally means rows, as in rows of something. Thus it is thought to refer to rows of olive trees or vines, meaning vineyards. The thought of this as vineyards or olive groves then lends credence to the next statement, take away her branches. This opening instruction is obviously being given by God to an enemy or enemies of Israel. And the olive groves and vineyards are metaphors for the Jewish people. So when God says take away her branches, he is referring to the Israelites themselves. 
But please note, God says, but do not make a complete end. We will see this statement again before we finish today. And it will reinforce the fact that the final eternal salvation which will come to Israel will only come to a faithful remnant of Jews. As we see throughout the entire New Testament, although all of Israel has God's law and all of Israel made their covenant with God, only ever do we see a small portion of truly faithful people throughout the Old Testament and then coming up through the New Testament. In verse 11, God makes it clear that the sinful behavior has come from both Israel and Judah. So punishment will come to the entire country. God says in verse 11 that Israel and Judah have dealt very treacherously with him. That phrase, very treacherously, is actually the same Hebrew word being repeated twice. First the infinitive absolute, followed by the cal perfect, in this case not the imperfect. But it still serves to make the point and in the wording of the Hebrew, this phrase actually starts the sentence for yet additional emphasis, saying, treacherously treacherous is how the house of Israel and Judah have dealt with our Lord. And their treachery is spelled out in the next verses. The people themselves lied about God, standing against all that his true prophets had said. They denied that God said that evil would come upon them or that they would see war or famine. Now verse 13 is seen by Hebrew scholars in one of two different ways. Either this is a continuation of the statements being made by the unbelieving Jews, referring to the doom and gloom prophets, the true prophets of God, saying that the word of God is not in them, and that they are the ones who will suffer the doom and gloom that they prophesy. Or this is a statement being made by Jeremiah regarding the false prophets themselves, as being windbags who don't have the word of God in them and thus will suffer the consequences of death or captivity along with the rest of the Israelites. Personally, I go with the first view as it maintains the context of the narrative. The unbelieving Jews thus chastising God's true prophets because they don't like their prophecies. And because of all these continuing sins of Israel, God will bring judgment upon them and will now describe their conquerors to them. Let's read verses 14 through 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people wood, and it shall devour them. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flock and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. Notice how this declaration starts. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, that would be Yahweh Elohim Saba, or Yahweh, God of armies. This is God Almighty speaking from his position as creator and ruler over a host of powerful forces, from the angelic hosts of heaven to earthly armies, which he may distribute and implement as he will. The Israelites may have mocked God's true prophets, saying that they were windbags, but God would show them through Jeremiah, making his words in Jeremiah's mouth as a flame of judgment, a fire of judgment, which would devour the Israelites by his prophecies coming true, and they would come true in the armies of Babylon. They were indeed a mighty nation and an ancient nation. They had been early on in the losing end of wars and conquest, but had grown strong enough to now challenge all nations for world dominance. Their language was foreign to Israel, so none of their pleas would be understood by the Babylonians. No bargains could be done. No bargaining could be done. No bargains could be made. It's interesting because we know that as this comes to an end, whenever they go off into captivity, that they will spend 70 years there and they will actually bring the Aramaic of Babylon back as their language to Israel when they come. But at this time, they will not understand that language. 
I love the poetry of verse 16. Their quiver is like an open tomb. Since the quivers of the Babylonian archers held the arrows which would bring death to many an Israelite. When finished, the empty quiver would be like an open tomb ready to receive all of the dead Israelites its arrows had made. And in the process of conquest, this foreign army would need to be fed. Thus they would devastate all of Israel by eating their bread, the fruit of their vines and trees, as well as their flocks. And then, with all of this energy, they would destroy the cities of Israel, even the fortified ones which the Israelites thought would protect them. Yet still, with all of this judgment and destruction, God maintains the promise he has continued to make through all of Israel's apostasy, which shows his love for this nation. Let's read verses 18 and 19. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? That you shall answer them. Just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. Nevertheless, in those days, in other words, the days that would be coming, the coming conquest by Babylon, with all of their power and ferocity, still there would be a remnant of Israel who would survive. And still, after all these decades of warning by God's true prophets, at that time, there would still be Israelites saying, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? This truly speaks of God's long-suffering. Even after all of this, God will still have Jeremiah carefully explain to them one more time just why this judgment has come upon them. Just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. Think of that, serving foreign gods in their land given to them by God. And we wonder why he's mad. God will now give Jeremiah a fresh new declaration showing his complete understanding of Israel's pagan attitude toward him, their actions taken against him, and his intentions concerning them. Let's read verses 20 through 22. Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. Although Jeremiah is a prophet to the kingdom of Judah, and despite the fact that it has been around 100 years since the 10 northern tribes were taken into captivity, we have spoken of the fact that representatives of those 10 tribes were living in <coughs> Judah at the time of Jeremiah. Thus God's opening declaration to be delivered in the house of Jacob, which refers to all 12 tribes of Israel, and proclaimed in Judah, the specific location where all the tribal representatives now live. So then this declaration is to all of Israel, and God opens by calling them all foolish people without understanding. They do not use their senses as they were given to be used. These Israelites knew that the ten northern tribes were taken into captivity because of their idolatry. Yet here in Judah, they cannot see or accept that they are now acting the same way and should listen to Jeremiah's warnings. And their problem is summed up in the question posed by God in verse 22. Do you not fear me? We and they are constantly drawn back to Solomon's wisdom expressed in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When you can acknowledge a fear of God, you are confessing to an intimate knowledge of Him, which means you know that this book, the Bible, is indeed His Word, and that you are a student of it, seeking to increase your knowledge of Him daily. 
Israel did not fear God at this point. They weren't in his word. And they weren't being led correctly in his word or in their required worship by their religious leaders because they were idolaters as well. As an example of his power, Yahweh speaks to Israel of the sea and the shore, two things with which they had great knowledge. And he reminds them that the sea, with all of its power, can never exceed the boundaries, boundaries he has set for it unless he allows it. Yet Israel does not fear him or tremble at his presence. And some of the reasons for this will now be given by God. Let's read verses 23 through 29. But this people had a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so their house is full, are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Okay, back to verses 23 and 24. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. It's important when reading these verses to remember that the Hebrew word leb, translated here as heart, refers to the inner being of man, his thoughts, his will, his intellect, his feelings. All of these are covered by the Hebrew word leb. So when we read that the Israelites have a defiant and rebellious heart, it means that all of them, every part of their thought process, their will, their intellect, their feelings, all of it has turned against God. And no longer did they in their entire thought process say, let us now fear the Lord our God, as their scriptures had instructed. Instead, their sin had seared their hearts and their minds, as we are told in the next verse. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. But then our Lord decides to call out the specific leadership groups of Israel who are not leading the people as they should. And he starts with the rich and the powerful. As I've mentioned before, the major sin of Israel which caused their judgment of deportation and captivity was their idolatry. But the prophets also tell us of another major sin, that of the rich Israelites abusing their poorer relatives. And that is what we see here in verses 27 and 28. In verse 28, we see that they have grown fat and that they, are surpassing, they have surpassed the deeds of the wicked. We aren't told who the wicked are here, but by that very title, we learn that these men are worse. And then we are given some reasons why. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. Remember, we always have to remember this. All of Israel is related to one another. So these are all, folks are all part of an, one extended family. But those who need the most help, the fatherless, the orphans, and others that are poor and needy, these rich do not help, nor do they defend these relatives. Their behavior is totally contrary to the Mosaic law under which they were to live and which declared the punishment they would suffer if they didn't. Evil against man is evil against God. Thus God then asks these questions. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? As before, when these questions were put forth in verse 9, the answer to both is yes. 
Our Lord then moves on to the other leaders who have left him in our last two verses, the spiritual leaders of Israel. Let's read verses 30 and 31. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? The true faith of Israel has been totally twisted and perverted. The prophets who were to convey to Israel the truth given to them by God instead give false prophecy. They told the people lies and said they were from God. And the priests who were to conduct the proper worship and sacrificial system given in the Torah to not only honor God and thank Him for their abundance, but also to provide a covering for their sins were indeed ruling by their own power, their own authority, <coughs> lightening the yoke of God's law, according to Albert Barnes, and thus removing the fear of God from the consciousness of the Israelites. This is why the Israelites love to have it this way, because it makes life easier on them. It took away their responsibility. But that won't solve their problems, which is why God then says, but what will you do in the end? Yes, you can turn away from me and lead an idolatrous, debauched life, but what will you do when it comes time to pay the piper? Of course, we know what they will do. They will cry out, Lord, why are you doing this to us? <laughs> now, what is that axiom of the law that we all learned growing up? You remember it. Ignorantia juris non excusa. So you didn't learn it that way? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. How about ignorance of the law excuses not? which is just a direct translation of the Latin, or, but we normally hear it as, ignorance of the law is no excuse for breaking it. So now, where do you think we got that axiom in the law? The Israelites plead ignorance before God, as we have seen in verse 19 when they said, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? But they knew better. They just chose to walk away from God and his law because they didn't like it. It was too restrictive. Their pagan neighbors had much more fun than they did. But what will you do in the end? They will pay the price. Because ignorance of the law excuses not. You know, this makes me worry about the practice of some of our churches today. <clears throat> Granted, we are not Israel and we are not under the law. But we are to be teaching the whole word of God. There are some churches today who never mention sin and the need to stay right with God. Instead, they just give positive, uplifting messages to make life easier on believers, taking away any thoughts of personal responsibility before God. This will affect their walk, and it will affect their end when they stand at the Bema Seat Judgment before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, he said, I'm so thankful for Jeremiah. Boy, this young man went for decades and took abuse and everything else because he stood firm for your truth and you protected him as you said you would. But Lord, through him, you just painted the picture clearly to Israel. And Lord, although we are not Israel, we see things, Lord, that we can take from this, Lord, because your whole word has been gi given to us, Lord, so that we may know who we are as the church today, and where we stand and what we are to do. We aren't under the 613 commandments you gave to Israel, but you did, did repeat nine of the ten moral commandments in the New Testament and gave us other instructions from your son, our Lord Jesus. So, Lord, we are not without our own, I don't want to call it law, but our own instruction, Lord, our own commands to follow. We are not antinomian. And, Lord, we can look and see from the behavior of Israel functioning in the world what happened with them. And we as the church can also function in the world, Lord, 
And the more we function in the world and adopt the ways of the world, the more our sin sears us from hearing your truth. So Lord, please keep us from that. Keep us in your word. Keep us in fellowship one with another, Lord. Keep us accountable one to another, Lord, that we may help one another. Because, Lord, we live in a world where the majority world stands against you and it is getting worse every day. So keep us strong, Lord. Keep us in your word. Keep us strong. Keep us full of desire to take forth your gospel every day to those who need to hear it that you may be glorified in all things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's grab our hymn books. <laughs>